Thou shalt not muzzle the oxen while it is treading out the grain. Now did God mean that for the sake of oxen? Or didn't he mean it entirely for our sake? Well, of course he meant it for our sake. So argued the Apostle Paul near the beginning of the Christian movement. And in various ways, it's that question and his answer that we'll be revisiting today with the help of a number of Australian scholars as we read the scriptures together through ecological eyes. My name's Jason John. I grew up knowing I wanted to help animals, maybe as a vet or a marine biologist, which led me eventually to honours in zoology. Then there was an apparent about turn as I entered the world of faith and found myself as a minister in the Uniting Church, ordained as a deacon. Deacons are charged with the task of helping the church work for justice for the marginalised and the oppressed, which for me includes the 99.999% of creatures which aren't human and whose needs are routinely marginalised in our decision making, politically and individually. So with Miriam Pepper, my colleague in Uniting Earth, I'm pleased to be able to continue that process through this webinar today. So let's have a look at two isms. The first is androcentrism or man-centrism. Blokes birthed the Bible and men for millennia mediated its meaning. And so they should, at least according to the author of Timothy, appealing to Genesis and backed up by church fathers for centuries ever after. Even in those few churches which now fully accept women's leadership, advocates acknowledge that the later New Testament writings reflect a steady drift towards the subordination of women. So there's some passages like Galatians 3.28 and Acts 18 which seem to place men and women as equals, and then there are others like 1 Timothy which undermine that. The church for centuries went with the latter emphasis, with Timothy, so that to ordain women now is to admit that the New Testament does not speak with one voice on the issue of the roles of women and men in the church. Even Paul seems to find himself pulled in different directions. And it's to claim that therefore even vulnerable church traditions must be subject to continual critique in the light of the gospel. And we've found it vital to do this continual critique, because unless we properly understand the relationship between women and men, we won't be able to act properly. No matter how benignly men might have treated women, if they saw themselves as superior and more important, that would be a permanent blight on their relationship and on the relationship of both men and women to God. So it seems to me that Christians who have engaged with this critique of androcentrism in the scriptures and in church tradition are well placed to respond to Lynn White's accusation back in the 60s that Western Christianity, is in particular because of its biblical roots, is the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever seen. So what does it mean that the Bible wasn't just written and interpreted by men, but by humans? So we come to our second ism, anthropocentrism or human centrism. Christian anthropocentrism includes the assumption that humans are the centre of the story of God and life. Drawing on Genesis 1, a common form of Christian anthropocentrism, assumes that human beings alone are created in the image of God, charged with dominion over the earth and given the earth and its creatures as a possession. Into our hands all things are delivered in Genesis 8. An increasingly common and apparently more ecologically friendly form of anthropocentrism tones down dominion in favour of Genesis 2, with its positioning of humans as the servants, or perhaps the farmers, and the protectors of God's garden. This gives us a far humbler but still absolutely pivotal role in the story of life, especially as it's connected with the theology of the fall, drawing on Genesis 3. So it includes other species as players in the story of God and life, but it still has human beings in the central starring role. Take the Uniting Church in Australia as a case study. On the one hand, our founding document envisages a final reconciliation and renewal for the whole creation, not just for humans. And yet in our first statement to the nation, when the Uniting Church formed in 1977, we proclaimed that we affirm our eagerness to uphold basic Christian values and principles, such as the importance of every human being, and a concern for the welfare of the whole human race. We are concerned with the basic human rights of future generations, and will urge the wise use of energy, the protection of the environment, and the replenishment of the Earth's resources for their use and enjoyment. In other words, the rest of creation is simply stuff for humans to share and enjoy. 
A decade later, non-humans were given a small role in our statement to the nation, but humans were still the centre. The United Church said in 1988, We affirm our belief that the natural world is God's creation, good in God's eyes, good in itself, and good in sustaining human life. And the United Church really hasn't moved beyond putting humans in the starring role of the story of God and creation. A consensus even amongst people who would like to shift that appears to be that it's too contentious to challenge Christians' belief that humans are the centre of God's concern. It would be as unpopular as Galileo telling us we weren't the centre of the universe. And so we should instead focus on getting people to do something about the ecological crisis. But can we do the right thing, or can we do enough, if ultimately we still think it's all about us and our enjoyment? If it was true that men needed to understand the relationship between men and women and God properly, do humans also need to understand our relationship to other animals properly, to have a proper relationship with each other and with God? And if so, if we need a revolution in our view of ourselves to act properly in the world, can we truly escape our self-centeredness as a species and learn to read the scriptures with ecological eyes? Can humanity do what some men have struggled to do since feminism and hear the voice of another, see God's relationship with another, in scriptures written and mostly interpreted by them? Sure we can. Well, at least a bit. And we're about to see how today. Anthony Rees will talk in a little while about some ecological lenses through which our various scholars approach the scriptures. But let me briefly put them in a broader context. Here's some of the scientific fields or the scientific lenses within which ecology itself sits. There's the cosmological lens, for one thing. Learning that our planet wasn't the centre of the story of God and the universe rocked our world and led to a few heresy trials. We sit in a galaxy which until the 50s we thought was the whole universe. A universe which is, is expanding like a giant balloon, in which time and space bend so that it's only 14 billion years old, but nearly 100 billion years in diameter. How big is it? Well, if you take every grain of sand on every beach and desert in the whole world, the whole world, you'd have about one-tenth as many grains as there are stars in the observable part of the universe. So is God the God of Earth? Or of our galaxy? or of the whole universe. The Bible didn't even know enough to ask those questions. There's the evolutionary lens. The story of our origins is far richer than the authors of either creation story in Genesis could have imagined. If we could somehow represent all of the existence of Homo sapiens, which has been about 200,000 years, in a metre, then we need 18 metres to represent the existence of our genus, of Homo, including Homo habilis and Homo erectus and so on. We'd need 650 metres to represent the age of mammals. We'd need 40 kilometres to represent the beginning of life on Earth. And we'd need a line 100 kilometres long, 100 kilometres, to represent the beginning of life in the universe, at least feasibly from when life could possibly have survived in our universe. And looking to the future, we'd need a line 700,000 kilometres long to represent the possible future life of the universe. On that 700,000 kilometre long strip, humanity takes up a metre. Human spirituality takes up about 10 centimetres. Christianity so far occupies just five millimetres. So there's plenty of reason to doubt that we're the main character in the book of God and life, even on Earth, on that 40 kilometre strip. In terms of years, we're barely a sentence or two. In terms of impact, maybe we're worth a chapter. At the universal scale, we probably don't even rate a footnote as a species. There's the geological or climatological lens. We now know so much about the processes which have shaped the mountains and continue to be felt in earthquakes, tsunamis, floods and even sea level rise. For many of us, God is not the central actor anymore in control of all of these things, nor are such events signs of divine displeasure, but rather consequences of geological processes. The oceans do not dwell in limits set by God, but have fluctuated by many metres throughout history and are on the rise again. 
In the last 200 years, Western human societies in particular have become another agent influencing geography and now climate. What does it mean that the Bible sees floods as judgment for the sin of a nation? But in Tuvalu, floods are being experienced by one nation because of the actions of other nations like ours. And of course, there's the ecological lens, how the world works. It's not humans who are essential to the good working of this garden planet. It's the microbes. They make the soil and they influence the rain, just to name a couple of things. Then the plants are next in importance. It's the decomposers, not predators, who are central to the web of life. For every human cell in our body, there are nine microbes and they make up 10% of our body mass. We'd be dead without them. So humans haven't been here long enough to have been given the job of tending the planet, nor of exercising dominion over it, except perhaps in this tiny 19th to 21st century window. The human ignorance which God flouts before Job is diminishing. Unlike the author of Job, we know that ostriches don't abandon their eggs. God mentions mighty beasts to put Job in his place. But we used to watch Steve Irwin regularly subdue Leviathan, the crocodile, and we've nearly made Behemoth, the hippopotamus, extinct. A proper understanding of our place in the world and how we should therefore live is not just an academic pursuit of knowledge, but a matter of survival of other large species like the hippo, and even of our own survival. The garden will go on fine in some form without us and will possibly even bounce back after we're gone, given enough millions of years. But will we have a place in its future? And there I go, being all anthropocentric and just caring about humans again. Finally, we need a reminder, the justice lens. We need to remember a lens which the church is more familiar with, kind of economic and social justice one. You'll often read about what, quote, we are doing to the world, but there is no we. So we should avoid the temptation to talk about how we are treating the earth and what we need to do. Not all humans have an equal impact on the earth. Less than 1% of us now control 50% of the world's wealth. So on the one hand, agriculture or industrialization may have signaled the beginning of the Anthropocene, the era when humanity became a major factor in the ecology of the planet. But at the same time, humans are certainly not all equal agents in this development. So addressing ecological issues is inextricably linked with human justice issues. To remind us of this, we might turn to the prodigal brother as an ecological parable. One son was wasteful and needed to come home humbly. The other son never left. So let's recap. As someone who started life completely ignoring the Bible, and then at my conversion believed that there was nothing we needed to know which couldn't be found in the Bible, I've now concluded that in terms of cosmology and evolution and climatology and most ecology, the Bible largely gets an F. But then it was never trying to pass. When it comes to environmentalism, the human place within the ecology of the planet, the intersection between humanity and the rest of creation, how does the Bible do? Can the scriptures help us live better as part of the earth family which lives and moves and has its being in the God who desires reconciliation and renewal for the whole creation? What happens when we read the scriptures with ecological eyes? Well, today we have a collection of scholars from around Australia to help us dig into that question through talks and plenaries and workshops so that we can all leave here with a clearer answer to that question and share it with others. So I invite you to stand and stretch to say good day to those around you and in five minutes, Dr. Anthony Rees will give us a closer look at the methodology which our other scholars will be using today so that they can leap straight into the meat of their talks. Thanks for being with us.